Life on Earth, driven by evolution, has existed for billions of years, and during that time there have been some truly incredible creatures. One of the first apex predators, Anomalocaris, the giant killer whale, Basilosaurus, and of course, Homo sapiens. But evolution's ability to produce forms that almost defy imagination was no more apparent than during the age of the dinosaurs. Some of these creatures grew to enormous sizes. At the time our story takes place, there were mo colossal mosasaurs ruling the seas while on land the biggest creatures ever to have walked the earth reigned supreme, the titanosaurs. But on an island in the Cretaceous Oceans, life was very different. There were still dinosaurs, but they were tiny. Even stranger, they were closely related to the mainland giants, yet appeared to be pocket-sized versions of them. But there were still giant predators, in the form of enormous pterosaurs that stood as tall as giraffes. Truly, this was a world turned upside down. But why? What caused this topsy-turvy world? And that's the subject of today's video, the concept of insular dwarfism and the life and history of Hatseg Island. The fossils of the life on Hatseg Island, as well as the concept of insular dwarfism, is the work of an aristocratic Hungarian scholar, Baron Franz Nopska. In 1895, Nopska, whose full name was this, which I'm not going to try and pronounce, had travelled to the village of Hatseg in modern-day Romania. Over the following years, Nopska and his team uncovered numerous fossils in the surrounding mountains that were from the Cretaceous period. Among the fossils was a new genus of sauropod belonging to the group known as Titanosaurs. This genus was given the name Magyarosaurus, meaning Magyar lizard. Titanosaurs, as the name suggests, are famous for being some of the largest organisms to ever walk the earth. Some, such as Argentinosaurus, may have grown up to 35 metres long and weighed as much as 75 metric tonnes. However, the fossils of Magyarosaurus indicated a length of only 6 metres and a weight of only 1 tonne. How could this be? These two were related to each other, yet how could one be 6 times longer and 75 times heavier than the other? Initially, it was assumed that the bones of the Magyarosaurus were those of a juvenile and that the adult specimen size was much larger. However, later testing showed that these bones did in fact belong to an adult. Nopska was the one who coined the term insular dwarfism. He theorised that being isolated on an island with limited resources would more than likely have the effect of reducing the size of animals over many generations. In other words, big things are gradually forced to become small due to lack of resources. But what was Hatseg Island actually like? Well, in terms of size, it's estimated Hatseg was about the size of modern-day Hispaniola Island, aka the island split between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Its climate was most likely tropical, with temperatures hovering around an average of 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, or between 68 and 77 degrees Fahrenheit. On top of this, the island's weather would be characterised by dry and rainy seasons. Yet, strangely, much of the plant life appears to have been largely tropical. This at first appears like a contradiction, as usually tropical plant species aren't suited to a monsoon-like environment. However, as seen today, some tropical plant species can survive in this environment, as long as they have access to sufficient levels of water year-round. And to corroborate this, Hatsak Island appears to have been crisscrossed with an extensive system of rivers and lakes. But of course, it wasn't just plant life where the island stood out from the norm. In all, we found around nine species of dinosaurs, as well as several pterosaurs that thought to be indigenous to the island. Many of these species differ from their mainland relatives due to island syndrome. Now, I think I should make a distinction. Island syndrome and insular dwarfism aren't necessarily the same thing. Island syndrome describes the differences in morphology and physiology between related island and mainland species. Insular dwarfism is one of those differences. In other words, island syndrome is an umbrella term which insular dwarfism fits under. That being said, many of the island taxa do exhibit insular dwarfism and are thus much smaller than their mainland relatives. As I mentioned previously, the titanosaur Magyarosaurus was perhaps not so titanic, with a body mass of only around 900 kilos, which is about the size of a large grizzly bear. Sure, that seems big, but when you consider that their mainland relatives like Pataka Titan could have weighed up to 70 times as much, they were in fact tiny. Similarly, there were hadrosaurs like Tamatosaurus, that were as small as cattle as opposed to the lumbering behemoths found elsewhere in the world, such as Edibontosaurus, as well as Iguanodonts, equally giants on the mainland, yet the Iguanodonts of Hatseg were about the size of a large domestic dog. Even the fearsome theropod carnivores would have stood no taller than a large human. 
And it wasn't just the dinosaurs, there were dwarf crocodiles such as Elodapusuchus. Around 25 million years prior, giant crocodilians such as Sarcosuchus terrorized Cretaceous rivers, with lengths reaching almost 10 meters. Elodapusuchus, however, was smaller than most crocodilians alive today, measuring only around 3 meters in length. However, not all insular taxa exhibited insular dwarfism. In fact, there was one glaring instance where that was the case. But first, we must answer the question, what causes insular dwarfism in the first place? The greatest regulator of life on Earth is energy, the capacity to do stuff. Everything an organism does, be it breathing, walking, or thinking, requires energy, and there's only so much energy to go around, so therefore no organism can do everything. We can see this in bacteria that cause infection. Human reliance on antibiotics have caused some bacteria to start exhibiting resistance to drugs that used to kill them. However, it's been observed that in doing so, they lose their resistance to their own natural predators, virophages. In other words, they can't maintain both resistances at once. It costs too much energy. Another area in which energy costs can sabotage the hopes and dreams of organisms is size. Being big comes with the advantage of being harder to kill, as well as it being easier to kill other things. However, it costs a lot of energy. Most organisms get their energy by consuming things, be it plants or other organisms, so therefore big creatures need very hearty appetites. Elephants, for example, have to spend three quarters of their day eating just to keep going. However, these things, plants and other organisms, are finite resources. Now, this isn't much of a problem on large landmasses where large creatures can live migratory lifestyles, constantly moving in search of food. But on, say, an island, such a lifestyle is impossible, and as a result, being big is, almost, is also almost impossible. There simply isn't enough food to sustain such a size. So when animals get isolated on islands, many start to change rapidly compared to their uh, mainland relatives, resulting in island syndrome. It's thought that the island syndrome on Hatseg may have even been more pronounced, as the island seems to have been surrounded by a deep marine basin as opposed to a shallow sea, making travel between the islands even more difficult. But what if an organism wasn't confined to the islands and could leave by some way or another? Well, there is one common way to do so. Flight. In the late 1970s, students digging in the Hatsek Basin unearthed a fossil belonging to a pterosaur that lived 66 million years ago. The fossil consisted of two fragments from the back of the skull, as well as a fragment from the left humerus. Other fossils, including wrist bones as well as neck vertebrae, were found in the years following, and in 2002 the genus was given the name Hatsikopteryx, and using the remains found, an estimation for the creature's size could be given. The estimates indicated that Hatsikopteryx was among the largest pterosaurs that ever lived. With a wingspan of between 10 and 12 metres, it was similar in size to perhaps its more famous relative, Quetzalcoatlus. However, while most giant pterosaurs were slimmer and, for lack of a better word, more dainty, Hatsigopteryx was far from it. It was essentially the Jimbro of pterosaurs. Its skull was much wider than that of its relatives, which had large muscular attachment sites. This indicated that while its neck was likely only half the length of similarly large pterosaurs, it was far more muscular and robust likely capable of withstanding strong bending forces. But there was another area where Hatsikopteryx made up for its lack of le neck, however. Its skull. It was absolutely enormous, initially being estimated over 3 metres long, however in 2018 this was revised to a length of 1.6 metres, after it was noted that the skull was very broad and, like the neck, sported large muscle attachment sites. Therefore, it was theorised that the skull would have been similar to the neck, being shorter, less pointy and much more bulky. These things mean that while there is, no, there is still debate over whether the biggest organism to ever fly was Hatsikopteryx, there is no debate about which was the most bulky. Hatsikopteryx also appeared to be more comfortable walking on all fours, just as it was flying through the air. It was also likely a terrestrial generalist predator, preying upon the dwarf animals on the island below. Its broad skull and neck allowing for the beast to prey on much larger animals than other giant pterosaurs. 
The giant pterosaur was able to circumvent the traditional drawbacks of an island environment and the dwarfism that comes with it. Because it could fly from island to island, it had access to much greater amount of resources. And because it had much greater access to resources, it could lead a migratory life. And because it could lead a migratory life, it could cope with the added energy costs that come with being giant. And thus, Hattigopteryx came to be the uncontested apex predator of Hattig Island and the surrounding area. But of course, it wasn't to last, as Hattigopteryx would disappear alongside all the other large Cretaceous life forms 66 million years ago. Today, over 100 years on, the work of Franz Nopska and the fossil formations around the village of Hatzeg are still hotbeds of discovery. At the time I'm making this video, there has been a new genus of pterosaur found in the basin, as well as a possible dromaeosaurid. The animals, events, and discoveries of this video are not just a testament to the wonders of nature, but also to humanity's curiosity. Without Nopska's insatiable thirst for knowledge, the field of paleontology, as well as paleobiology, would arguably never have been the same. And we're currently living through a golden age of paleontology. Who knows what else we will discover.